an OG in this industry, right? Like you've seen a lot of deals and you can jump on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever and a lot of people talking about my companies, but very few of them have been in 10 years in this. So uh, probably seen a little bit of everything, if not everything. Uh, and I think most of the listeners are hanging out in that range, you know, that 400 to even a million dollar, maybe something what you're doing in terms of seller discretionary earnings or even up in terms of the price that you're looking at. So, um, it's not like you work a lot, of, a lot of times with first-time buyers. Before we jump into some of the war stories, there, uh, what does it, what does it typically look like when a first-time buyer comes to you? Uh, you know, what, what, what kind of uh, typical mistakes do you see on a first-time buyer? What kind of those first few conversations they have with you, or when they should engage you? Should it be for LOI, under LOI, or should they be in the conversation? Sure. So for our first time buyers, oftentimes they engage in our deal sourcing services, which are a bit before letter of intent. And what I find there is people are looking for both sort of how to get in front of more deals. Like I think if you're looking at one or two deals a week, you're just not looking at enough. We help people get to a number far larger than that pretty quickly. And I think a lot of the mistakes people make, in my opinion, is overanalyzing the limited data you get at the beginning. So you start with these things and either the seller sends you tax returns or maybe there's a broker in the deal and they send you a five page write up and some information and people will do like a hundred pages worth of analysis or like five levels of negotiation strategy to get to a letter of intent. And Ryan, you and I know at a certain point, the next thing you need to understand is, is the seller willing to sell at a reasonable price and structure? And you have to get there quickly. So I think people, at that beginning stage, spend too much time overanalyzing things, honestly. You need to be prudent, but not overdo it. If you move forward in terms of diligence, I think the next thing which is related is people look at data that's not a primary source of data. So if I'm the seller and Ryan's looking to buy my business, I'm like, hey, Ryan, here's a great, glossy marketing 30-page paper on guardian due diligence, we'll call it a confidential information memorandum, and all of the financials are being nice, cute, lined up things that don't have QuickBooks at the top or Sage Software or Zoho Financials. The taxes will be sort of printed in nice ways that don't have like 1040s at the top or anything of that nature. And so people spend, I think, a lot of time looking at data that's not primary. The data you should be looking at should have QuickBooks at the top, IRS at the top, or the name of a bank for bank statements at the top. I think people fall in love with deals, particularly first time buyers. So that business 20 minutes from your house, right in that size range you wanted, in that industry you always wanted to be a part of, you know, you're out in Utah, so like that ski board manufacturer like looks really great, you're gonna be the, the dude. And then because you love the deal so much, you don't want to do the work on checking the numbers and the sellers are typically more experienced and they take advantage of people. And then fourth, I would say not realizing the layered nature of due diligence. So at the beginning, as a buyer, you're sort of interviewing for the job of new owner with the seller because they don't have to sell you the business. They could sell to somebody else. And so you're, you're earning trust. And I think if you If you mess up at the beginning, you can give yourself a lot of demerits that are hard to make up for later. And as you build trust, I think the questions can get tougher and the analysis can get tighter. But if you start from like a clipboard with 300 questions, I think it's a great way to screw up your diligence process. Uh, Let's dive into that last piece right there, because I think you said something that I've said a lot and I probably don't even say say it enough. as a buyer, you're actually interviewing to be the CEO of the seller's company. So yep. You might think as the buyer, oh, I've got all the chips on my, uh, on my side because I have the money. Right. Uh, walk us through some experiences. I'm you're shaking your head, right? So walk us through what you think about that and how, how buyers can actually approach those additional conversations as an interview to be interviewed with the CEO. Yeah, and I'm kind of going to throw some shade to some of the, you know, fancy business school people out here who I'm one of them. But, you know, sometimes you go in here and you're like, oh, I bring the chips to the table. I'm smart. I know how to do my industry analysis. I know how to calculate EBITDA. I'm going to go in and let's say I'm talking to Ryan's business and I've seen people do it. So, Ryan, why didn't you charge more money? (laughs) Ryan, why are your systems so terrible? Ryan, QuickBooks is cheap. Why are you using this Zoho weird thing? Or Ryan, why haven't you hired anybody new in five years? And although those are very reasonable questions, because you've built no trust, 
you're some random person with unqualified ability to buy that the person doesn't know yet. This person is what I call a free man or woman. And if you ever try to put a free man or woman in a cage, it's sort of like putting a wild animal in a cage, you're going to experience the same pushback. And then you haven't earned the right to be at the table yet. And so you have to be careful because people will blow up deals. I've seen, I've been on calls with clients who I've advised not to do this, but they just have to. And they'll go through 25 questions berating the seller, thinking, I got all my questions answered. And then the deal will blow up. Like, what happened, Elliot? And I'm like, you put a free woman in, who owned a business in a cage. I, I told you not to do it. It's not in the book anywhere, but that'll blow it. So you have to be thoughtful about that. 